How about if I just start at the beginning? <laughs> you could you could be honest. Because <laughs> you know what? They have the sweat equity that went into that memory that they're making with their friends and family. And that's what's important with us, and that's what the I Am Real World's about. Well, that's a great question. You know, one of the best things about a spring food plot is you get a second chance if it fails. Chasing Giants with Don Higgins. Brought to you by buyafarm.com, your source for farm, recreational properties, rural homes, and more. By tapping into Don's years of experience, dedication, and commitment, Chasing Giants focuses on the techniques, strategies, and dedication needed to harvest one of God's most amazing creations, world-class whitetails. Now, here is Don and co-host Terry Peer. Well, welcome to episode 13 of Chasing Giants, brought to you by Biofarm.com. Uh, ATA episode two, we're going to talk about, Don. Yeah, we just, uh, this is our second day in a row of uh, doing a podcast. We started uh, yesterday with some interviews we did at ATA, and we're going to wrap it up today with the last two, which will be Matthews and Quiet Cat. Uh, also, we're going to mix in some submitted questions and a buy a farm property of the week. Yeah, and um, you know the the goal here in busting it up is we just didn't want to make a hour and forty minute long episode. So, um, but we think that the uh, the information that each of these companies bring to everyone not only showcases their product a little bit, but as you could hear in episode one when we're talking about the family that runs Lone Wolf and obviously with real world, but today you're going to hear from Matthews and Quiet Cat. You hear a little bit more about the people and the company and what they stand for, and that integrity and that relationship is more vital to us than any product or check that anyone could ever throw to us as a sponsor. Yeah, absolutely. Who we are partnered with is kind of a reflection on us, and we are a reflection on them. So we want uh, like-minded people. We want high-integrity people, um, you know, when possible, Christian people. Um, but those are the kind of companies that we, we look for. Um, and we've been so blessed to, to have, you know, a handful of those companies who believe in us as much as we believe in them. Yeah, and, and we can honestly say that all of these um, companies, we use their product prior to – really being sponsored so we believed 100 percent in their product and I, I guess i'm kind of a little i take care of all the sponsorship stuff on the real world side and when somebody comes to real world and asks us to be on a pro staff or to, for us to sponsor my first question is have you ever used our product before because if they haven't i think it's unethical for them to go and recommend us to somebody else if they haven't personally seen the advantage or that it gives you as a whitetail hunter. Um, I don't think that's right, and I don't want that partnership from the real world side, and I refuse to do it from my side. So all of these products we completely 100% believe in. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Matthews, for example, I, I've been with them for about 20 years now, maybe a little more. Um, but the integrity of that company is unquestionable. Um, we talk about it a little bit in this interview, but if people only knew what Matthews does with their profits, they would everybody would be shooting a Matthews. Yeah, it's a um, pretty special uh, mission and company, and even even he admitted it in this interview coming up that they don't talk a little bit about it, and it's not because they're ashamed of it. It's that they don't want to draw the attention to themselves for the work that they're trying to do. So I know you the 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 key statement in this is. Since the first time you shot that Matthews, you haven't shot another bow. That's been, what, 20-some years? You think closer around 20 years? It's been at least 20 years because, uh, well, I know I became a member of their paid pro staff in uh, 2005. Okay. I shot at my, my biggest buck in December of 2004, and about a month later I was at the ATA show carrying that rack around, and that's when I met you, Terry. Yep. And I stopped by the Matthews booth because they was one of my sponsors at that time. And I showed them, wanted to show them the rack of the big buck I just shot. And uh, Mike Zybell, who's been with Matthews for a long time, told me that he would be contacting me after the show and putting me on a paid position. 
it was my first paid pro staff ever in the hunting industry. And I'd already been with them a few years before that. Um, but since that day that I got my first Matthews, I have not shot a single arrow, not one arrow out of another brand of bow. That's how much I believe in that company. And I'm not far behind you. That same year was the first year I was on um, a product staff with them. It was because I remember it was the year we had the switchback, which was a great bow. Um, mm-hmm. Still one of my favorite bows that Matthews ever had. But uh, since then now, you know, with my shoulder injury, I have shot their crossbow, which is the company called Mission, which that company is, is uh, you know, it's it's actually uh, helps mission work all around. So that's, so between the Matthews family of companies, you, you got um, 35 years combined between Don and I where neither one of us have shot a air out of a non-Matthews or mission uh, piece of equipment. So pretty special story and an awesome interview coming up with uh, – with the folks from Matthew. So listen here. Well, welcome back to ATA 2020. Don Higgins and I are in the real world booth, but we have an uh, awesome visitor that came over to stop by, Mark from Matthews. Welcome to the booth, and thanks for coming over and taking some time. Thank you, guys. Yeah, we're excited to be here. So big year for Matthews. Uh, you guys did your pre-release of some new bows here recently and pretty good feedback from everybody before the show. Tell us a little bit about what came out and how the reception's been at the show. It's been great uh, since we launched in November. We came out with the VXR, and there's two bows in that line. It's a 31 and a half and a 28. Uh, the big thing we're talking about this year is in the riser design. They got long, extended, we call them six-bridge risers. Uh, traditionally 31 and a half is not a long bow um, obviously 28 is not a long bow but these things shoot like long bows and what I mean by that is if you look at our target line that is winning podiums um, they are long stable risers with short rigid limbs um, you know that's the direction we're going because those bows win tournaments um, how do you get that in a compact uh, hunting unit um, it's basically the VXR we got a, the longest riser we've ever made um, in the uh, mainline hunting line. It's, a, uh, it's almost the size of one of our target bows, the TRX-36. Um, so it's just stability and accuracy uh, built into that riser. So for, for the average hunter that is not a 3D shooter, um, in a tree stand, a lot of times maybe not in a perfect posture position, uh, that shooting like a longer bow is going to give them a little bit more forgiveness Absolutely. On that shot, because um, a lot of times, you know, we take it for granted. Sometimes when we're when we're practicing for hunting season, we get out in our yard and we're at perfect posture, You're standing, standing there, flat-footed, and, and, yep. and we get in a tree stand. And you know, Don and I, even this year, we we almost got a shot at, at a target buck, in, almost pushing 170 <laughs> with his Matthews, and he's almost wrapped around the backside of the tree, you know, ready for the shot. So that that design of that is going to give a little bit more uh, forgiveness for for a hunting situation, also. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's two lengths because there's two different types of hunters. Like I shoot the 28 um, just because of the situations I find myself in. That's going to be um, the better platform. But I don't like to give up accuracy. I shoot tournaments myself, too. And I don't want to shoot all summer super accurate and then give it up in hunting season. And that's uh, traditionally what you're doing with a short bow. You're giving away some stability. The goal with this line was to not. And, and it's really proven through. Uh, we had tons of shooters with them before we launched uh, killed a lot of stuff with it and just it has proven itself this entire year and historically don you've you've liked the longer bow absolutely uh you know the year the z7 came out and you also released the z9 yes the z9 is my favorite bow of all times <laughs> in fact it's so favorite i haven't given it up yet <laughs> but uh i'm going to kind of put you on the spot a little bit here mark uh you know the the uh, archery industry is changing uh crossbows have become a bigger and bigger you know, influencer i guess yeah uh, more and more guys going to them um you know the, the compound bow is kind of losing out with a lot of companies but the vxr seems to be the one bow that's held its own in, in this changing market um can, can you talk about that changing market a little bit and how it's affected matthews absolutely so we have a, a crossbow line ourselves in the mission uh line mission crossbows the highest end crossbows you can get in you know, crossbows are a tool to get people in the outdoors. Um, it's good for uh, people that can't pull the enough poundage or people that have 
um, gotten injured or getting elderly. Um, so we see it as a tool just like anything else, but um, we are still through and through vertical bow people in Matthews. I mean, um, giving people the tools they need, though, is something we'll always do. We can make the best crossbow, so we do. And uh, we just have two lines that I think are really synonymous with what all the technology we, we like to pride ourselves on being at the forefront of that. So putting everything we can in both tar- in lines. But uh, I think crossbows are definitely have a place uh, in, in the industry. Well, the VXR is one bow that I think has made a bigger splash <laughs> than probably any bow in a long time. I remember, I've been with Matthews and their pro staff for about 20 years now. And, uh, you know, I remember when the switchback came out, that was a big deal. The mm-hmm. Z7 was a big deal, and on and on, the, the Halon and such. But uh, the VXR is one that everybody's talking about. Even guys that are fans of other bow companies, they're even talking about the VXR and switching to it. Yeah. So you guys hit a home run on this one. Well, thank you. And, you know, we're, we're staying true to how we design bows. We design bows first for a good bow, and what that means is efficiency. Um, you're putting in effort to pull that thing back. You want to get as much out of it as you can. The, the back side of that is if you have an efficient bow, there's not enough wasted energy f- to make it feel buzzy or loud. Mm-hmm. And that's where uh, I think we're really setting ourselves apart. We have the most vibration-free, the quietest setup, and that's just uh, our tagline is elevating the archery experience. That's all about that. When you shoot your bow, it's a pleasure to shoot, and you're going to shoot it more. You're going to enjoy that entire experience. There's also been some cool accessories that we've added this year that have changed the way people use uh, their bows, uh, specifically the SCS system, Silent Connect. It's just simple, two little knobs that go screw right into the cup, but it's an interface for a couple of cool new accessories like a bow rope. Um, you don't think about it, but the carabiners that people use, they're loud and clunky. Tying a knot is not always the best thing Absolutely. to do. Absolutely. Now you have a spot that you're comfortable with, you got a cinch, um, and it balances the bow really nice, too. You're not catching things on the way up. The other cool thing was the sling. Now, I've never been a sling guy, um, but we were testing it this fall, and, man, did I use that thing, especially out west. Um, being able to strap it to your back, um, even when you drop a pack and you're on a stock, it just changes the way you use that thing. You, you tie it tight to your back and your hands free. Uh, it's really a cool accessory that goes on and off quickly and silently it is not obtrusive yeah that's a it, it's not as much our style as being traditionally you know mature buck mm-hmm. whitetail hunters in the midwest but i was talking to somebody uh, um, here at the show that does a lot of stock hunts out west for pronghorn and mule deer and everything and he would used a word i'd never personally heard before and that's hand fatigue and when you're stalking whether you're crawling walking you know miles upon miles and you're holding that bow in your hand yes you get hand fatigue mm-hmm. from that exercise and being able to put that bow on you but be able to get it off you know very quickly and quietly to get it back in your hand exactly and be able to anchor for that shot he was super stoked <laughs> about something as simple as a right. sling that adapts so easily to to the bow. Now, does does those accessories only work with the new VXR, or do the guys that have a Halon or a Cree going back can can those be adapted, or is that only new well, bows going forward? It's only on the VXR. We okay. specifically machine the cup to accept gotcha. this accessory. Um, we do have another accessory though that does fit all the way back to the Halon. That's the engaged limb legs. It's a new bow stand that keeps the cam off the ground, keeps your arrow off the ground, and balances a fully loaded bow, stabilizers, quiver, all this stuff. Oh, I bet your blind hunters love that. Love it, yeah. And I've actually used it in late season crawling into buck bedding. You know, oh, okay. Because yeah. I have to keep up in glass every once in a while. You just put your bow down. You don't even think about it. But that it. cam stays out of the mud. Out of the mud. You can have an arrow knocked, and it doesn't touch anything. So, yes, ground blinds, spot and stock. And you can shoot with that on then? You can shoot with it on. That's wow. the best part. It attaches right to the cup, just cams over. You can take it off pre- pretty easy too, but when you don't have time to, you just lift it and shoot. It does not affect point of impact. Very cool. Don's got one question. <laughs> I, got, I got one more thing I got to throw out there. You know, I, I mentioned I'd been with Matthews for 20 years, cause I, and I know you're not going to say anything about this, but I'm going to throw it out <laughs> about the integrity of Matthews. Several years ago, I had the pleasure of interviewing Matt McPherson for a magazine article, and the article was titled, The Matthews You Never Knew. And basically, I think if if more people knew about the humanitarian things that Matthews does around the globe, 
that uh, more people would support this company. I mean, they're making the best bows out there, hands right. down, no doubt about it. But besides that, what is Matthews as a company, Matt McPherson personally, what is he doing with the profits that he makes from this company? And at the time I interviewed him, you know, I think that if I remember right, they had dug uh, like 70 water wells in impoverished countries around the world. Um, and it's basically spreading the gospel, but he's doing it by uh, humanitarian works. You know, that, that water well would bring people in those rural communities to one central location where they could then hear the gospel. Missionaries were sent in. I forget how many missionaries Matt told me that uh, Matthew's sponsored around the world. And I know you guys never talk about it. I've never heard any of you guys talk about it. And I was with Matthews for a long time before I even knew you guys did this. And, uh, you know, as, as someone that's, uh, you know, been sponsored by Matthews for 20 years, I just kind of feel an obligation to share that with the rest of the world. Um, you're not only making the best bows, but uh, you're doing things silently behind the scenes that nobody hears about <laughs> that uh, really sets you guys on another level from really anybody in the archery industry, I think. So well, uh, keep up the great work. Thank you very much. Yeah, we don't talk about it a lot, but I'll tell you internally, Matt reminds us every meeting that the reason we are here is to make money to do God's work, and he's doing it in a practical way. Um, there's a something called the conspiracy of kindness, um, doing God's work in a practical way that actually changes someone's life just to the fact of doing it. And and when you're providing things like that, yes, they're getting water, and they get to hear the gospel, but not in a forceful way. You know, you're actually providing something to, for them. So, well, it makes is, it makes us proud. You know, Don's been 20 years. I'm 15, and that's 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 more that's more of a testament that we're partnered with somebody that's not afraid of that mm-hmm. like we are um, to be partnered with you guys. And not only are they good bows, but we know that it's all for the greater good, which is what we're all here for anyway. Well, it's obvious that your company has been blessed. I mean, from the outside looking in. And especially now that, well, for several years now, I've known about the the good things you do. But standing back and looking, Matthews has kind of been an example that real world has tried to follow. Because you guys do the right things, but you do it silently. You're not standing on a platform, look at what I did. You're just behind the scenes doing great things. For the right reasons. Spreading God's word. And as fellow Christians, we really appreciate that. We appreciate all you guys. So thank you for your support. Well, thanks for bringing it up. So as you sign off, tell us where, if someone was interested in Matthews, where do they go? What do they do? Yeah, How do they learn more? So go straight to our website, matthewsinc.com, to get all the information you need to get your hands on the bows. Hit your local dealer. We have a dealer locator on the website. Um, Find the one that's closest to you. They are experts, the guys that we trust. So head in there. All right. Well, um, hope you have a great show. Again, thanks for the support and thanks for stopping by. Um, I, I don't get sick of listening to that interview. That's awesome to, to say, to hear a company say that what their real mission here is to really make a difference in someone's life. Yeah. I thought it was real interesting. Uh, when he said, uh, you know, that Matt McPherson, what, what he talks about in, in each of their meetings. And it's, you know, basically the more money we make, the more, uh, good works we can do around the world and and it's literally around the world yep i just um you know you you made mention to it a little bit that we've kind of modeled our um business model a little bit after matthews when it comes with that you know if we have the option to um whether it's a vendor or a supplier to that it be a, a, a fellow Christian or someone that is not scared to share their faith. I know a lot of our pro staffs that we have, um, um, it, it almost, we, we try to help the other people out there that are um, um, trying to do for the right reasons and that serve the Lord and spread his gospel. So pretty cool feature. So um, let's, let's transition to, uh, you got a customer question, I guess, before we do the buy farm segment, right? Yeah, uh, the first submitted question is from Craig Koopman. He's from Bartelso, Illinois. And uh, Craig says, question about calling and rattling. What is the best kind of call to use for each part of the season? Pre-rut, rut, post-rut, and late season. Also, when is the best time to rattle during the day? And is this effective all season long? Could you give examples on how you use each? And this almost reminds me of a question we got yesterday about scent control, Terry, because uh, I do not call and rattle. I, I carry a grunt call with me, 
and I I might blow on it a couple of times all season. Uh, basically, if I see a, a buck that I believe is a shooter out of range, um, then I will, if he doesn't appear to be coming my direction, I may try that grunt call. But I believe when you're hunting mature bucks, and uh, I'm talking bucks five, six years old, they know the game way better than most hunters do. And when you go to banging on antlers and blowing on calls, you're telling those bucks, here I am, stay away from here. Um, I think for every bu- every mature buck, now I'm not talking about two and three-year-olds. Uh, I'm talking about the old bucks, the five and six-year-olds. For every one of those five and six-year-olds that you rattle in or, or bring in with a call, you're going to spook off 20. And that's not an exaggeration. You will spook off 20 times more than you call in. And for that reason, I, I do not use calls. I do not carry rattling antlers. On very rare occasions, I will use that grunt call. And usually when I use that grunt call, it's when I'm, I've got another hunter with me. You know, maybe um, a young hunter that uh, I'm trying to kill a call buck on my property or something, and I see the target buck, and he doesn't appear to be coming within range. That's when I'll use it. Most, I can't remember calling in a buck and then shooting it myself. So, uh, you know, similar to the, the uh, scent question we had yesterday, I, I'm just, I just don't use them. Um, I don't carry a set of rattling antlers with me anymore. Um, I carry enough junk to the woods. <laughs> it's just, yep. it's just too much of a pain to do it. Um, I know people who are successful in it. My hunting partner, Patrick Simpson rattled a buck in this year during shotgun season. Um, so I know there's people that successful about it. All I can do is answer the question, what my style is. I don't rattle. Um, and I will call a on the rare case, but I never blind call. Um, I remember shooting a five and a half year old on your property two years ago, Don, where he was getting ready to cross the creek and I could see him and I grunted soft and just barely increased my levels until I got his attention. Um, and he came in and I did shoot him. Um, but even when I'm hunting with you, I think in all the times I've ever hunted with you and we've spent a lot of time in the woods together, I've only seen you blow on a grunt call once. And that was to, and you could see the buck, you knew where he was at. You could read his body language. You didn't just start puffing on the thing like it was a saxophone. So um, that's, that's that was a, this year, right? Yep. Yeah, that that's that's yep. that's the only only piece of advice I can give. I I just I'm not going to risk blowing my position. I want to be in the right place for that buck to come by and uh, trust trust the process that way. Mm-hmm. But if I do call, it's it's where I can watch the mannerisms of that deer as I'm calling, just blowing on a call. If you want to hear what not to do, go to like episode, what it was at six, where I drove to Illinois to hunt a specific (laughs) spot. And there was a guy on the property line rattling every, go listen to that episode. If you want to know how not to call. Yeah. And I'll I'll throw out there that uh, the time you heard me call this year was actually the, the first buck that I shot this year on November 3rd you and I were in a stand on October 4th, a month before that. And I had this buck at about 50 yards or so in the brush. And so I started and it was getting towards dark and something was going to have to happen pretty quick. I tried to grunt call to bring him in and he did not come one step towards us. Yep. So it did not work. Yeah. Whatsoever. And I don't know that he heard you or he didn't. You didn't. I mean, like I said, you, you just put, it was just a, Rant, rant, or however, I don't know if it was one puff, I don't remember, I probably have the video footage of it somewhere, but it wasn't just blowing on that call, he did not commit, he did not come in, you didn't do anymore, uh, right. but it was a very soft one, like I said, reading the mannerisms of that buck, but I think the worst thing you can do is just start wailing on it um, blindly, so is that all you got for that question? That's all I have. All right, let's move on to the biofarm.com property of the week. Biofarm.com is your source for farm, recreational properties, rural homes, and more. Now, here is Don Higgins with this week's featured property. This week's featured property is 155 acres in Saline County, 
near Galatia, Illinois. Uh, this is a very unique property, um, one that I think holds a lot of potential. But of the 155 acres, 60 acres of that's tillable. There's five stocked lakes on this property. Uh, those five stocked lakes total about 40 acres. Um, there's also some brush and timberland for hunting and home sites or whatever. There's plenty of open grass areas for food plots. It just looks like a sportsman's paradise to me with, uh, you know, all the water and uh, the tillable acres that are there, uh, the timber. It's got uh, road access on two sides. Uh, and the, the crazy thing about it is it's pretty cheap property. It's uh, uh, it's listed at under $2,400 an acre. Um, the taxes on the whole place are under 2000 an acre for the entire year. So uh, it just looks like an ideal property for the all-around sportsman who likes to waterfowl hunt, fish, deer hunt, turkey hunt. You could do it all at this place. Good road access. Um, anybody that's interested in this property should contact Mark Kennedy. Uh, he's the biofarm agent in that area. Uh, Mark's phone number is 618-924-1747. So when you're looking at a property like this and, and say say somebody goes to buyfarm.com's website and they look at all the pictures, when they're looking at like these open grass areas or the aerial views of these farms, you know, we can all get on Google Earth and or or our app on our phone and, and look at the the way the ground lays. Does this property have the like entrance and exits that you could, you know, really really make it a, a good deer hunting place and in, in, in addition to having the the lakes for fishing and waterfowl hunting yeah it absolutely does because it's got roads on two sides yeah. um, so that gives you access from two directions right at least but uh you know a lot of times i'm looking at a property as a, as a serious big buck hunter right and I, I often overlook the fact that not everybody is like me there's a lot of outdoorsmen that like to do it all. They like to fish. They like to waterfowl hunt, small game hunt, turkey hunt, deer hunt, trap, whatever. And this is one of those properties that would be ideal for someone like that because, I mean, you could do it all here. I mean, you got 40 acres of water in five different stocked lakes. Right. And it's so cheap. I mean, the, the price of this, um, you know, you can't hardly lease ground for what you could buy this for. Yeah, and you got some tillable acres that you get some income. Taxes cheap, um, so yeah. So, but when I when I heard you say that that it's got plenty of road frontage to to guys like us though, that means okay, that's more stand sites that I can get in and out of and don't have to walk through the core of the property. I mean, right. that's that's Absolutely. just where our mind works. So it's got a little bit of everything for uh, people with with different objectives in a piece of property. It sounds promising. Yeah, and uh, you know, one one guy could go in there. He could kill his turkey. He could kill his deer. He could catch plenty of fish all summer. He could he could be waterfowl hunting, and then he could trap as well. So it's just the opportunities are endless here. Yeah, pretty cool property. So I'm assuming this one is also on the biofarm dot com uh, website. Yeah, it is. Yeah, all you got to do is go to the biofarm dot uh, com website and look for 155 acres in Saline County, and Mark Kennedy would be glad to show that to you. All right, so let's move on to the Quiet Cat um, interview, and and it was kind of neat watching. Our booth was directly across the aisle from Quiet Cat's booth, and they had this big. It's it's hard to tell how big their booth was. It was like one whole section where people could actually ride the bike around an area, and uh, it was kind of funny watching everybody get on those bikes and and drive them around and take them for a spin. Well, I'll tell you, when I first heard about Quiet Cat, a friend of mine told me uh, that I needed to get one. I mean, when I first saw him, I thought this is the most ridiculous thing that's ever hit the hunting industry. And then uh, a year or so later, a friend of mine had one. He said, you got to get you one of these things. Um, and he go, started going through the advantages. You know, you're not putting scent on the ground. It, they're, they're quiet. I, they're actually quieter than walking. Right. And uh, you can drive them right to the base of your tree and then, so you're not leaving ground scent anywhere except right there at the base of your tree. Just lay that bike over in the weeds or whatever and climb up. And um, I'll tell you what, I'm sure glad I got one because I use it more than I ever thought I would. 
and and the power that these things have um pretty phenomenal so uh let's listen real quick to the quiet cat interview from ata 2020 all right back at ata 2020 and i have jake from quiet cat uh here and it's been a pretty busy show. I've, I've watched this obstacle course area that you all have testing these bikes, and it's been busy over there. You've had a lot of people riding bikes this week. You know, uh, we have a lot of space, um, so we wanted to keep it pretty open. Uh, so we've got a bunch of big light boxes um, that are all lit up with the Quiet Cat brand. Um, we've got, I don't know, 12, 14 bikes for people to try. Um, thank God we have not had any crashes yet, um, and we're winding down, so... Looks like it's all gonna roll out safe. Yeah, I, uh, I saw a couple uh, couple people getting towed around in the wagons oh, this no. week. <laughs> I was I was a little cringing at that because they were speeding up and down the aisle pretty good. And well, I mean, you were cring- cringing from that, and I was cringing from the size of the fella <laughs> in the back of the cart. I mean. There isn't a buck that size out there, so I was like, "Yep, it held up." But the tires uh, don't maybe had they have like you know fifteen twenty pounds of pressure in them, and they were right to the ground. Yeah, uh, no, was, they work. So um, you know the platform the platform of chasing giants is we're talking about targeting mature bucks four and a half years or older, and putting plans together all year round to try to, to try to uh, to try to harvest those bucks. And Don has used Quiet Cat as a vital part of his his plan and not only hunting but also the management plan of going in and, and uh, checking trail cameras and checking the property it's been vital for you and in, in the properties that you hunt absolutely it's a it's, a, it's an absolute game changer um, you can ride this thing right to the base of your tree never leave ground scent the thing is absolutely quiet it's actually quieter than walking you know when you're walking you got that cadence of crunch 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 as you're walking through leaves and this thing just it doesn't have that i've rode right by deer out in a in a wide open field and they just look at you like what the heck is that thing where when i did it in in the past on my atv you know them they're bolting when you're a quarter mile or half a mile away and it's just been an absolute game changer i use them for checking my trail camera so i'm not leaving scent i ride right up to the camera right up to the tree it's on so um there's not a you know, the ground scent on the path you take to get there. Um, I, I didn't believe it. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll be honest. When I first seen these things advertised in, in hunting magazines, I thought that's the most ridiculous thing i ever seen in my life. But, man, once I, I had a good friend, Brad Davis, told me about it. He had one. And when he, he says, you've got to get one. And I know he's serious about big bucks, and he wouldn't just be saying that. So I did get one. And I'm telling you what, I wish I would have had one the day they came out. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. That's uh that's 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 a, a true real story and we hear it again and again and again and you mentioned that cadence and that's super interesting right because that human walking is a predator sound mm-hmm. and a bike rolling is not a predator sound um, uh, to the whitetail yet anyway right as, yep. as it becomes millions of these in the hunting woods that might yeah. be a different story um, right but you know you guys mentioned um, uh, the chasing the big bucks and in the arena that we're all talking about here is the whitetail, right? And the management around the whitetail and the trails um, that you build and the food plots and then where you put your cameras and such. Um, And really specifically minded this year with the Quiet Cat, we developed um, a very interesting uh, rear end of the bike that allows um, the customer to quickly change the modular dropout from a geared bike to a single speed bike um, and in the whitetail world, that single speed bike, and I don't know, Don, if, if you've ridden that one yet or tried it, but there is no derailer. There is no shifting. There is zero that can go wrong with that portion of your bike. Um, so you won't get sticks or corn stalks or bean stubble or CRP up in your gearing, which then ultimately can throw your chain off or you know derail your bike. So that, that's one really interesting piece that we built under the bike this so year. So should we, I'm a big guy, should we put Don on a bike and put me in the wagon? <laughs> no, we won't well, we already saw it. We'll, it wasn't <laughs> you guys, but actually there are a we'll lot We'll put Don on you. the bike, but I'm not getting in the yeah. wagon. So uh, is, is, that, is that new rear end design, is that released at the show this year? Yeah, or? yeah okay. we released so it. So what's the feedback been on that? Uh, you know, it's fantastic, you're right? I mean, um, it, allows, um, it allows a person to have a bicycle, um, a quiet cat, and they can 
you know, have it built for different purposes. So a lot of these guys, yeah, they their their passion is around the management of their farm, uh, whether it be in the Midwest or on the East. Um, but you know, most of these guys are passionate about hunting in general, and they're going to take a trip to Montana or Colorado and really sure. hunt some steep terrains. And it's nice to be able to have the opportunity to, you know, change your bike out to the train that's the, and to the gearing that's proper for right. it. So, and I think I think the people, um, you know that are making a purchase decision, you look, at, you look at a consumer buying cycle, you know, people that are considering buying a four-wheeler to use for hunting also need to consider these platforms because with the wagon and carrying in, if you're feeding, you can carry in your mineral, you can carry in your tree stands, but doing it. But the thing that interests me most about it is how many guys that maybe don't have a truck and a trailer that maybe hunting out of an SUV can get the hitch adapt uh, attachment to this mm-hmm. and very effectively, whether they're maybe a field sales guy or something and they go after sales calls and, and stop and hunt can travel around with this thing being so portable that you don't need to have all this peripheral stuff with you all the time, you know, throw this up on a hitch receiver in the back of your truck, maybe your SUV and be completely mobile on times that you wouldn't normally be able to do it. So the guys that are looking for a, maybe a side-by-side or a, a four-wheeler, I think, need to look at this as, as an alternative. And I'll tell you, the thing that really shocked me about them, I, you know, I, I didn't know anything about them. I thought you had to pedal first, and then you hit the button, and then it took off from there. You don't have to pedal a single time. But what really shocked me was the power this thing's got. The first time I was sitting on that thing and I hit that go button, well, I was in gravel, and we it literally threw gravel and peeled out. <laughs> and I don't know how fast it'll go. And the reason I don't know because it goes fa- it'll go faster than I want to go. I mean, I've had it up to thirty mile an hour, and that's I'm getting old enough. I don't want to be crashing in, <laughs> at thirty mile an hour on a bicycle, and, keep, and it still had plenty of gears. Keep the rubber on the road. Exactly. Down. <laughs> there you go. Well, so, uh, the, the ATA show is always a way for manufacturers to release new stuff and new product lines, and you've talked a little bit about that. But we also see new companies pop up, and, and it's no different in this industry. The thing that I find interesting is occasionally we see the, a new pop-up in the electric bike, but there always seems to be one constant, and that's Quiet Cat. And, and um, tell us a little bit about Quiet Cat as a company. What, what is your bike built you know, we, we know you guys as owners and, and we work with your uh, media group, but that, that's a different company. But what is it about this that there's all this transition and people in, people out dabbling in this, but you guys remain constant? What is it about Quiet Cat that sets you apart? Well, you know, um, you know um, when Quiet Cat developed, um, you mentioned the level of portability, right? Yeah. And it was uh, in 2012 when we developed Quiet Cat. So we're not real new to the space. And there was one thing we had in mind is like, and that we haven't faltered from, and it is the level of always being portable right. and always being quick and nimble and quiet. Um, and then it's about building the brand. Um, and, you know, building the brand and building content is really important. Yes, you want to have an awesome product that works every time, but you also want to br- build a brand um, that people want to be around and want to jive with. Um, I almost like to say Quiet Cat in our niche of a space is similar to the Yeti. You know, I mean, there's lots of coolers and coffee mugs out there, but how do you feel when you, you know, drink out of that? How do you feel when you're on a Quiet Cat? And there's a certain, you know, energy and atmosphere around that brand that we want people to align with, and that's Quiet Cat. And, you know, it's, it's, it's all terrain. It's all electric. It's all off-road. And it's not just hunting, you know, it's not just getting to your food, to your tree stands and checking your food plots. It's going for a ride around your neighbors and to a barbecue and, you know, having a good time doing it. Right. You know? there's, a, there's a lot of similarities there with real world. But at the end of the day, this room's filled with a lot of smart marketing and branding people. And if you don't have that quality, rigid product that works behind it, it, yeah. it doesn't work. People That's, see through it. And you guys have done a great job bringing both of those to the market. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, you know, our, our original company um, and still very alive that we work a lot through is Urge Media. And we've recently, and you guys have come on board with that, is created uh, um, the Quick Hunts platform. And it's just an area on uh, television, on the Sportsman's Channel, to tell a story. It's not a TV show. It's just a, it's a place to show your story. Um, and that we use those types of platforms and areas to 
you know, tell, tell that story about the brand or the specific use through films and content. That, and I know you guys are big around the content also. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you and uh, Justin are really innovators in this industry because I remember when you guys brought the first cell cams, the smart scouters, to the industry. You know, Very first cell we were ahead camera. of our time on there. I mean, yeah, there's, about, there's about four, 30 of them in this room today. Um. <laughs> yeah, and you're the first to bring the, the electric bikes to the industry. Yeah. Um, your urge media is, is huge. A lot of companies in this building today are using it and, and utilizing uh, some of the platforms that you guys have brought to the industry. So Yeah, and you, and you have to, one thing we also learned is that you have to be adaptable. You know, you mm-hmm. have to be able to move and change um, and not get stuck in in the rut Um, so I I only have one request as we're going to wrap up here in just a second next year at ATA when you all have this big booth here with this this uh, open space we want to put some of our giant miscanthus wall in the middle of it as obstacles for everybody to drive in and around this stuff well, I, I actually think that could help um, steer the traffic and there will be you know guaranteed no crashes uh, yeah. we can we can work out and bring you some giant miscanthus and build you some walls it's so. the court we'll, we'll build the course well right? i got a quick marketing idea for you, for you jake got? um you know i'm getting up there in years i'm in my mid-50s now my wife the uh, last summer suggested you know we need to start getting in shape a little bit we need to start exercising a little bit. Maybe we should start bike riding. And I said, yeah, that's a good idea. And uh, <laughs> You'll ride your quiet cat. I was going to ride the quiet cat and make her pedal hers next uh, to it. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a good idea. And um, our new batteries, you know, you saw that we totally integrated our batteries right. into the frame. So you don't see the battery anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you're on to something there. She Don. might want me to buy her one, though. So I'm just throwing this out there for these hunters. You know, you, your wife wants you to get in shape. Buy a quiet cat. Tell her you're buying a bike so you can get in shape and then buy her one at Walmart and make her pedal and you just ride along and watch. <laughs> so, Jake, if somebody's curious about quiet cat, the brand, the, the specs, what's the best way to find out more information, find them, purchase them? Where do they go? You know, we really support our dealers, um, and we're in many dealers across the country. Um, on our website is a listing of all those dealers where you can find them. On the website, you can also find out information about each and every model um, and what the differences are, because there are differences, and you know it's best to align one with with what works for you, whether it's price or performance or such. Um, but um, I guess you could start on our website and then find the dealer that's close to you, and you know go take one for a ride. You know, right. most of all of our dealers have got a demo one in their shop on their floor, and that and they're for to, they're for you to ride. And you guys do a great job on social media too, so check them out there. So we appreciate yeah. you coming by, and we hope you have a great uh, ATA 2020. Well, Don, I know both of us when we first heard about these electric bikes, kind of probably rolled our eyes a few times, but after using them, it's been a game changer for everything that we do. Uh, absolutely. Um, I won't be without one from here on out. Yeah. I'll tell you that. And, um, you know, if you want more information, you know, uh, we didn't talk about it too much in that interview, but after that interview, we went over and, um, that new, uh, kind of direct drive, uh, model that they have that, um, where you don't actually change gears on that back sprocket really has our eyes open. I think that's the one I'm, that, uh, I'm planning on running this year. Um, so, Basically, you have your electric shift on the motor, but it's a direct drive on your chain instead of having the different gears down there. So uh, all that mechanism down there doesn't get caught with corn stalks or bean stubble or anything like that. So I'm pretty excited about that new design. I think there's going to be a lot of hunters that take these things through uh, open ag fields are going to really like that feature. Yeah, that's just that's been a minor problem a couple of times. Uh, when I rode the bike through, and I mean, I'm telling you, I drove the thing through very, very thick weeds and other vegetation. And a couple of times I did get some vegetation caught in that rear sprocket. But uh, that problem is now gone with this new model. So for the guys that are using this, like in the mountains out west, you know, that, that gear shift in the back sprocket, that's probably necessary doing real steep climbs. Uh, the guys that are using their their trailer or their wagon, um, they got a little tow wagon that goes behind these bikes that you can bring your deer out on. Uh, we saw guys at the show <laughs> pulling people around. I saw uh, uh, Kiski riding on the back end a couple times when people pulling him around the show. 
but the yeah. the people that are using it for that application, you might want to go with that um, that gear shift on the back hub. Uh, but for the guys doing what we're doing on flat ground um, and getting from point A to point B, that new design is going to help us a lot. So um, let's finish up with our last submitted question and uh, of episode 13 and ATA uh, volume two uh, podcast. All right. This last submitted question is was submitted by Dean Wessels. Uh, Dean's from Fairbury, Illinois. Uh, Dean says, on the podcast, you keep talking about establishing bedding cover. What is your recommendation for establishing good bedding cover, particularly in timber? Do you recommend some sort of TSI, hinge cutting, girdling, etc.? It would be great to hear your take on the establishing good quality cover for whitetails. I struggle with keeping deer bedded on my property year-round or even consistently during the season. I have 45 acres of ground with 20 acres of CRP. 15 of those are right next to a road with a house and a dog across the road. The timber consists of several large, giant linn trees. I'm not sure what a linn tree is. Packberries and walnuts. There are also several oaks, hickory, cherries, and hedge trees scattered across the property as well. Would you recommend removing any of these trees and letting underbrush go up? or replace those trees with fruit and nut-bearing trees? Well, Dean, that's a good question. I was actually working on some habitat today on my own property. Um, I'm not a big fan of hinge cutting, although uh, I think it's got its place. Usually when I go into wooded cover to uh, improve the bedding um, situation on a property, I'm using a combination of girdling larger trees, dropping some of the smaller trees and girdling some of the smaller trees um with a right, few i'm stopping you for a minute stuff. what's girdling mean because i know there's people out there that don't know what it means so explain that real quick well girdling is when you take your chainsaw and you cut a, a ring around the tree and between the bark and the wood is the cambium layer and that cambium layer is where the well, the tree sends the nutrients up and down, you know, like from the leaves to the roots and such. So when you girdle the tree, you need to go through the bark and through that cambium layer into the wood a little bit. Uh, you need to make a ring completely around the tree. And it's even better if you'll make two rings about a foot apart. But that girdling of, of that tree and that cambium layer will, will actually kill the tree. It severs that flow of sap. Uh, basically from the roots up to the, the top branches and leaves. Okay. Uh, so a lot of times I'll use that girdling on, on bigger trees that, uh, you know, maybe you're a little bit dangerous to cut down or, um, you know, they're leaning in a bad direction or whatever. You can, you can kill them. And, and your whole, the whole goal in doing all these uh, different processes is, is to get sunlight to reach the ground. Uh, you want to put some ground cover down there too in the form of fallen trees so you know a lot of the medium-sized trees are the ones that i'm just cutting off uh, you know leaving a little stump a foot or so above the ground and just totally cut cutting them off and then the smaller diameter trees you know maybe the ones that are three or four inches in diameter are the ones that i'm um, typically hinge cutting right uh, but I, I use a combination of all of girdling just dropping trees and hinge cutting rather than focusing on one of those processes. So on 40 acres, he's talking about, he already has CRP. So if he has a good stand of switch grass, you know, he's got bedding there. Um, I've heard you say in the past, what is it? Two to one bedding to food, something like that. Yeah. The, the food on a property, I, I like to have food there year round so that, you know, you want enough in the winter and the fall that it's going to last through the winter into the spring when things green up. And it just varies with deer populations on particular properties. So, um, I, I always monitor my property in the late spring to see if I've got food left. If I don't, the next year I plant more acreage. Um, if I've got plenty left, then I usually uh, keep it as it is, but, uh, it, it kind of fluctuates with the deer population in your area. So uh, there's really no hard and fast rule. Yeah, and, and he says he's keep having keep trouble keeping deer bedded there. That could be, a, I also, I think you said something about a house and a dog there too. So if he's got intrusion or pressure, 
that's another factor that's got to be evaluated too. So um, yeah, for sure. Check out dogs you know, are the worst thing. Yeah, I mean we've we've fought that battle a lot of different properties, but you know if there's if there's a house close, you know that giant miscanthus that we just have been talking about with real world might be a good problem or road frontage. Um, you know, give some security of a thick wall of that stuff might help you. But um, but I would definitely consider also the intrusion aspect, not only with your cover, but you got. Oh, that's a, you, a very you, good point. You got a and you got a spot on your farm that you've never been in, but once a year. And when we shed hunted it last year, you were scratching your head saying it's too open in here. I got to open this up a little bit. I'm assuming that's probably where you were working today, right? It is, yeah. So um, let that the, build up a little bit. The the point you made about intrusion, Terry, we need to hit on a little bit harder here because human intrusion is the one thing that a mature buck wants to get away from. He, he'll bet out in the middle of a wide open field if he has to to get away from human pressure. We've seen that during gun seasons uh, a lot, you know, where deer get chased around on a big buck just goes out in the middle of a wide open ag field, beds down. Uh, where nobody can get close to him, but uh, it's that freedom of human intrusion that he wants more than anything. Right, and I, I think that is where most deer hunters and land managers mess up is they put way too much pressure on their property, and they think they're they're not. You know, they think, well, I'm just going in here to plant my food plots or or do this or do that, and uh, any human intrusion. I mean, a, a deer doesn't know if you're hunting or on a nature walk or or what you're doing. He, he doesn't want to be around you. It doesn't matter what you're doing. He doesn't want any part of you. So that human intrusion is every bit as important as the quality of that bedding cover. And an example of this is earlier this year when I saw, shot that uh, six-year-old on my place, that's only 33 acres. And he was bedding on me and he was eating on me and a very small property. And, um, you know, you and I kind of talked about a game plan because I knew during the rut he wasn't going to stay on me. It's too small of a piece of property. But I have one patch of woods and one thicket that I don't go in, and I don't go near it with the wrong wind. So, you know, I, I don't attribute that to the bedding itself, but the lack of pressure I put on that farm is why I was able to kill that deer. Right. So. Yep. All right, that's the last question. Uh, Dean's going to get a free Chasing Giants t-shirt. Now, we did have some people at ATA stop by and want to buy them. Can you buy these things still on your website, Don? Yeah, they're they're on my website. Uh, just go to ChasingGiants.com, and you can buy those t-shirts right there. But uh, submit questions. If you uh, we use your question, then uh, we'll send you a free one. And I, I might add that... Uh, you know, we're getting away from, we're getting in the off season now and, uh, we've got a long list of questions that have been submitted. So we'll be answering a lot of those in upcoming, uh, podcasts. Uh, I'm probably going to try to pick different topics for different podcasts and then find questions that are related to the topic we're covering that week. So, uh, if you haven't submitted questions yet, be sure and get those questions in and, when you fill out the form on the ChasingGiants.com website, make sure you fill it out completely. Uh, we need your address and everything so we know where to send that T-shirt. Yep, right on. All right. So any uh, closing thoughts? you got some land consulting you're probably going to be working on, and um, I'm going to be here not too far from now frost-seeding my clover. So we're getting into that season, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Uh you know, last week or the week before ATA, I was uh, spent several days in Michigan looking at properties. Um, next week, I'm going to be headed to where am I going next week? I'm going to be headed to Missouri, uh, Southern Illinois. I'm going to Indiana tomorrow, uh, Western Illinois over the weekend. Uh, the last week in January, I'm going to be in Ohio. Um, so I'm going to be traveling around quite a bit for the next, uh, uh, let's see, three months, two months. Yes. Um, so if you're, if you're looking months, at, actually. if you're looking at getting Don to do a land consulting job, get with him now, because if he can combine it onto one of these trips, uh, he, there's a whole lot more likelihood that he's going to be able to fit you in versus make a rogue trip to Kansas or Iowa after he's already been there. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And then let's touch real quick on your master classes. You have the date set on that, and we're doing a little bit different format um, the night before because for the majority of people that come to that uh, class, they come in the night uh, and spend the night. So why don't you talk a little bit about what we're doing different this year? Yeah, the, the dates this year are March 14th and April 4th, which are Saturdays. But on the Friday evening right before, um, we're going to have everyone in, uh, kind of a social hour. We're going to have pizza and pop uh, and visit. But we're also going to record a Chasing Giants podcast each of those evenings. And uh, those people that are in attendance, we're going to take their questions. Yep. And uh, we're going to be you know, put the, on the spot. No editing. Of course, we don't do editing. <laughs> Most people think that that we spend a lot of time in post production. We 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 are able to talk about deer hunting so much that this kind of goes pretty simple for us. But we're going to be live in front of a big group of people doing these uh, doing these podcasts. Yeah. So we'll have no idea what questions are going to be fired at us, and um, there's still a few openings for each class. Um, the, the uh, but I've talked to several people that are are bringing groups. So if you're interested in either one of those, uh, either March 14th or April 4th, uh, that information can also be found on the same website, chasinggiants.com. Um, but uh, you should get uh, get on the list real quick. Just require a small deposit to to hold your place. Um, anyone's interested, just. Uh, get in touch with me and the cool thing about this class is you actually get to walk out and see where world-class whitetails were shot and um it means so much and it, it triggers so many ideas of what you can do on your property not only with food plots bedding cover stand locations and entrance and exit routes um it triggers the imagination of what you can do elsewhere by seeing these and uh, i'm going to be honest with you some of the places that you will visit that don has hung a stand and shot a deer in you would have driven right past it so you'll you'll learn a lot and uh, it's pretty cool pretty cool class so it's got yeah very good feedback from the people that's that's taken it so far yeah it's unlike any other course that's being offered because uh just about every stand I don't know how many stands we looked at, but there's probably about 10 or 12 different tree stands on two properties. And there's been bucks shot out of almost all of them. And a lot of those stands, multiple bucks have been shot from uh, several booners. Uh, the 200 inch Smokey, the blind I shot Smokey out of in 2017. You can climb right up in that blind and you can relive the hunt in your imagination as you're sitting there. Um, but but I'm not selling unproven theories or, or ideas. Uh, we're going right to the spots where it happened. And I'm even in some cases showing video footage uh, from that stand and, and the hunt of shooting those bucks. Yep. And then we go out and see where it happens. I mean, you see the stand that you shot the fork time buck off of this year. I mean, we, we, we stood underneath of that stand for 20 minutes last year for that class. Yeah. So, so when they, we get to each stand... You know, I explain my entrance and exit to that stand, why I put the stand there, and what the deer are doing. And uh, Terry's right, that stand where I shot my first buck this year, or this season, is one that uh, everyone who attended the class last year stood right under that tree and asked questions and uh, got to see it. And then, lo and behold, this fall, I shoot a buck out of it. And then the other thing for all of the food plot and bedding cover, the the – the farming side, I guess, is the, for lack of better terms, that are going to get a kick out of this. When they walk around your property, they see the test plots that you've done over the years for real world. So you'll get to see the giant miscanthus, you know, in a four and a five year patch to see the maturity of and how the deer use that or how you can use that as a screen. You're going to see switchgrass um, that was other people's varieties that we put side by side for the dare to compare challenge that is laying on the ground with the real world switchgrass six seven feet tall um, last year you had tested a, a different variety of soybeans that was completely shattered on one on one food plot and then we go to another one that has the real world beans and they're all in in the pod so you're going to see i don't know you're probably done with side by side testing at this point i would think but um you're going to see some of that other products like cave and rock where it's, it's nowhere even close to what 
uh, the real world stuff is because you know your farm has been used for that test site just like mine has here in Kentucky for a lot of years. Yeah, and I do did have some test plots that I planted last fall um, that we'll see. But, uh, you know, my farm has been like the proving grounds for real-world products. If it didn't work on my farm, it never wore the real-world label. So uh, you can come and see where that happened. All right. Well, do you have anything else before we sign off? No, I just uh, hope everyone has, has uh, ended their season well. Um, get out there. This is the best time of the year to kill a buck. Uh, even though hunting season's over, this is where you put the pieces of the puzzle together and do the work for next season. Next season starts now. Right. So on behalf of Don Higgins, BuyFarm.com, I'm Terry Peer. We want to sign off for this episode of Chasing Giants, and we want to thank our sponsors, Real World Wildlife Products, Vortex Optics, Matthews Archery, Lone Wolf Tree Stands, 360 Hunting Blinds, and Quiet Cat Bikes. So... Um, as I mentioned before, 360 Hunting Blinds was not at the ATA show this year. Maybe we'll get them together sometime and do an interview to make up for that. But uh, we'll sign off for now. We'll see you in about a week and a half or two weeks. Bye.